um, um, quality framework for specific uh, use cases. And, and the end result was that it, it always depends on, on uh, what happens in the, in the field during the experiment. So we'll always need uh, sensibilization on um, air quality as, as a whole <coughs> with citizens, uh, but also on the difficulties of, of monitoring air quality. I mean, um, the fact that so many um, citizens um, are willing to monitor air quality and believe this can be done uh, cheaply. Um, that is an indicator that, that um, some sensibilization is, is uh, required also on um, uh, how low the, the concentrations uh, actually are that we want to uh, monitor, how difficult uh, those things is. So, so sensibilization is always a, a basic thing that, that can be done. Obviously, you would prefer to do it with, with um, uh, uh, usable results at the, at the end um, because that will motivate the citizens. Um, but looking at the problem from, from the other uh, way around, uh, even with a um, well-performing sensor, uh, we've noticed in, our, uh, in one of our workshops with, with European experts that it's not possible to say up front that um, you will be able, able to um, um, measure the outcome you are, you are looking for. For instance, if you want to evaluate the, uh, the implementation of a measure, um, you, you, it might even be difficult with, with reference equipment. So um, we brought together a number of, of uh, European experts and tried to devise some some standard um, um, quality framework for specific uh, use cases. And, and the end result was that it, it always depends on, on uh, what happens in the, in the field during the experiment. So we'll always need a degree of, of, uh, of experimentation. Um, there might be some, some minimum level we can build on, but um, even with a good sensor, you, you're, you're unsure that uh, your use case will be valid, which is why in our uh, roadmap, I think it was at the end of the, of the interview, I mentioned it as well, um, we, we um, recommend to build a, a, a sensor network or any um, kind of deployment um, based on, on experimentation and, and uh, validation of whether you can actually uh, use the sensor for a certain, uh, certain use case. Um, Jordi might have some things to add from his um, expert point of view as well. Yeah, I, I guess it's it's a it's a matter of uh, what's wrong and and, and what what's not. Uh, some sensors can be wrong at, at a certain moment and and be right or, or less wrong at, at another moment. Uh, for example, for PM for the PM sensor, I think it's very important to to know what these sensors are picking up and what they're not picking up. Like we've seen uh, both in the in the lab and in the field that they're really bad at picking up PM cores. So you, you should know that you really, these sensors are not very good if you want to start tracking, uh, let's say uh, construction works, um, certain industrial activities, uh, resuspension by, by road traffic. Um, your, your sensor is not going to pick up those. So you, you should be aware of that. However, we do know that the, the most of the PM sensor, or, or basically all of the PM sensors, are, are pretty good at picking up wood smoke. Um, so it, it's one of these things that it, there's, there's no right or wrong. All right, welcome to episode seven, vacuums. Uh, this first slide here represents the, um, the feedback and the interest I've gotten, which is not much. Here's my page here and the beginning videos. You know, I haven't really advertised much either. I really got a post on the AIHA and I've, I've done a little bit of, hey, check this out. So it got pretty good interest, but um, nothing really uh, participation wise or feedback. Um, even when I give my presentations to professional organizations, you know, there's a little bit of interest, but nothing serious. I haven't been able to find any kind of partner or anything, but I wanted to kind of talk about in general, if you're gonna look at getting a sensor system and you know, the I'm gonna talk more about the Dialos than the Rascal in this episode, but I highly encourage you to go to my Rumble page and, and listen to this presentation I gave. I think it's a really good basic introduction to, to for, for the novice or even the IH to see, and it's centered around the Dylos. Um, but I wanted to uh, just give you some pointers and, and talk a little bit about 
about my journey. I thought this was a funny picture. I just found this. Um, these are two IHs or researchers and they're carrying around all these real-time monitors and a reference, looks like a reference monitor there um, to uh, kind of test those out. So there's definitely people working on this. This is a gas um, vapor and, and um, this is peracetic acid, I think. Um, but it just, you know, goes to show you that um, it can be fun. Okay, so the first thing you kind of, I guess, want to decide is, you know, if you want to use real-time monitors, well, are you, are you going to use personal or area monitors? And one thing is I would love to use personal monitors, but the very simple reason why I didn't kind of explore that is, you know, you want to try these out, you want to demo them, and all the people with the, uh, you know, pretty, and they're pretty high-tech um, wearables, uh, our granite shop is very wet, so I said, "Hey, look, I want to try this out, but this is going to be in a wet environment." Is you know, and I didn't want to take the risk of having anything broken or or anything like that. So, um, and, and besides that, there's really no low cost um, that specifically is designed for being worn, and and I would imagine it's got to be a little bit more robust because of the water and everything else than the area monitor. So I my I kind of went with the area monitor and that kind of goes more with the what I'm trying to accomplish now I I recently did like a market research five sensors the five sensors I use for rascal um, ended up costing about seven thousand dollars and I found a mid-range option which seemed like a pretty good sensor um, Wi-Fi capable some kind of dashboard but it's triple the price and it, the, the, the dust track um, can be set up for remote monitoring. You've got to buy some kind of um, cellular, you've got to buy a different product to hook to it that, that provides the cellular. You've got to go to another company to get your dashboard. Uh, but that's $60,000. Um, so really, I think right now, I know mining industry is playing with these and um, if you want to go to the commercially available market of, of the normal ones, you're going to spend a lot of money. And the whole idea with a sensor network, like an area monitor, like I'm trying to accomplish, is ideally you want more sensors. You'll give up some um, precision or accuracy in the sensor if you can get more out there. So it's much better to get a bunch of cheap ones than get a few really good ones. I mean, that's the whole point. And the thing is, what you're going to find is it's going to be hard to find a good monitor that's fit for use, that fits your budget, and a good dashboard. Um, you know, some of the dashboards I heard from one person who really complained about one, uh, you know, they, they got to be user friendly. And the most important thing, the one that I worried about the most was the communication as far as getting data from the sensor to the internet. To the dashboard, and that's not that's not a for sure thing, and that's why you one of the reasons why you really want to get these things into your worksite to te to check them out, to demo them, is to check test that communication. So we are very fortunate with um, the company that I use. You know, we had an arrangement a three month trial, which was really needed. You know, you need time and to really prove it out. So now I want to talk about a few things here. So this is an example here. This is in Australia. Um, this is like a consultant company and they advertise and they're, you know, this sensor real time dashboard thing is getting into the work environment, probably mostly through mining and other industries that have a lot of money. But this person involved with this, you know, pretty much said that they go with the AM520, which is a $5,000, $4,000, $5,000 when it's all said and done price for each sensor. Uh, but it can be worn. And, you know, in this kind of situation, it'd probably be fine for water. But, you know, in a real-time setting, the idea is to get data every day um, 
for the whole shift. I don't think people are going to want to wear these kind of things forever. But I think in most part they're using this for, you know, you wear it for a while, you figure out where your trouble spots are. And so it, it's good to see. I mean, there's definitely applications for it. Now you have this recent webinar here, which is really good. I, I encourage you to check it out. We've got the uh, Dr. Bill Mills, and he's putting in air quality sensors in the campus there. And he's, he explains a lot about this too. So this is, you definitely want to check this out. And then they go to this lady. Now this is, you know, this is the kind of stuff that just blows my mind. You know, what are you trying to say here? Um, you got all these, all this stuff around here. And it's, I don't know. But I think this was a, um, I, I don't know what they were using with this, but this is another country and there's a lot about unions and then the privacy and data. And then we have a silica one here that talks about silica. And, you know, so again, people are playing around with these. Um, they're looking for these. And so this is another great webinar. Now I wanted to talk to you about mine, my the original one, the Dylos, and let me see here which one I want to use. I'll start with this one here. So I s s I'm going to show you the research I did. So Dylos was a relatively low cost air quality monitor. Um, off the shelf, I got one, I played around with it, and it was effective enough to say, okay, what do we need it to do? What, what changes do we need to get it in, to work for us? And I was fortunate to have a partner who funded the prototype and basically Dylos made some changes. And one of the big ones was the high concentration mode. That's definitely something you really got to look out for. Now, in, in the granite shop there, you know, we have the dust under control. We're looking for um, getting out of control. We're looking for
I think most people would agree with this is, is that if you want to get into the occupational realm and you want something that um, is a good fit, where you can get a good dashboard, where you can actually get it to communicate with the uh, uh, website or dashboard, it's going to be very difficult. And you're going to have to pay a medium price. Um, you know, you're not going to be able to use these super, super, super cheap, like Purple Air and all these um, super cheap ones. Probably not going to work in an occupational environment because the concentration range isn't enough. Um, the uh, reading of the coarse particles isn't enough. But again, this is where the, the we get an advantage with the uh, silica. Um, because the silica is regulated in the in the respirable range. But anyways, check this out. This is all about ambient air, so take that with a grain of salt. But you can see how they play around with these things, how they test them. That's what you need to do. And these, you know, these sensor companies. And, and let me just say this: I was very fortunate for the rascal that I get all three of these. Um, the communication was just enough. The Wi-Fi at the work um, wasn't overly complicated, otherwise it wouldn't have worked. The dashboard, they're making the dashboard, they're designing it. They are, um, uh, you know, just in the beginnings of this and they're they're able to change the dashboard around and, and it was pretty simple. And maybe I'll do an episode on dashboards. Uh, but it, and the, the monitor was fit for purpose. I had three months to do reference sampling, testing and uh, comparing it and moving it around and doing all that. So so that's pretty much it for this. Um, if you're an IH, if you think you have an application for real-time sensors, you need to do a lot of research beforehand. And then these sensor companies really got to be more open to letting us play around with it in the field. Uh, most of them want to sell it to you and they'll say, you know, you can return it in 30 days or whatever. That's really not ideal. Um, you know, they, sh they should be more willing or they should have data. You know, that's the other thing is they, they should be able to show you data, show you performance. And I'll, and I'll end with this, so, you know, even the, the big boys like um, TSI dust track, they should put five of their dust tracks together in, in an environment and just run it and come show us the data, show us the intra-sensor variability. Um, show us how much they will agree with each other. That's a very important thing when you want to do a sensor system, when you want to deploy a sensor system. And those are the kind of things, wouldn't it be great if the um, sensor company could actually show you some actual data? And not, not in a lab, do it in the, in the real world, it's not that hard.